My name is Ariel Jones and I am the Development Director at Mocha GA. And I want to welcome you all to tonight's artist talk featuring Mocha GA's 2019-2020 Working Artist Project Fellow, William Downs. Um, the Mocha GA Working Artist Project is an awards program to support established visual artists of merit who reside in the metropolitan Atlanta area. This initiative provides unparalleled support to individual artists, expands the museum's mission, and promotes Atlanta as a city where artists can live, work, and thrive. Mocha GA's Working Artist Project program is very generously supported by the Charles Lohr Dance Foundation, the Antonori Foundation, the AEC Trust, with additional support from the National Endowment for the Arts. This year's round of Working Artist Project Fellows was selected by Wesson al Kaderi, who is currently the chief curator at the Contemporary Art Museum St. Louis, and fortunately is here with us today. So thank you, Wesson, so much for being here with us. Thank you, Wesson. Um, William Downs' Working Artist Project exhibition is titled Drawings of Wilderness and Silence. Born and raised in Greenville, South Carolina, William Downs works in a range of mediums, but focuses primarily on drawing. He received a multidisciplinary MFA from the Mount Royal School of Art at the Maryland Institute College Baltimore. of Art and a BFA Baltimore. in painting and printmaking from the Atlanta College of Art and Design. His work has been presented at numerous venues in the United States and abroad. Downs is currently a drawing and painting lecturer at Georgia State University. And so now, without further ado, a video presentation from William Downs. Hello, my name is William Downs, and I would like to talk to you about my exhibition called Drawings of Wildness and Silence here at Mocha GA, Atlanta, Georgia. I would like to thank Wesson and Annette and everybody at the the museum for hosting this show. This has been a great pleasure and um, a lot of emotions of joy, happiness, all those things for bringing this whole thing together in a time where things are a little weird, but that's how it is right now. So I'm going to walk around and give you a small glimpse of what goes on in my mind and how this whole thing unraveled to be something that can be in your mind. This work is purely about human existence, human um, gathering, hu human behavior. It's about everything that we do or don't do. It's kind of a dream, but a reality at the same time. Um, I'll talk about a few things that I'm influenced by, I'll talk about how these works come together, I'll talk about the present more than the past, because so I think right now the work is in a, a different compartment. So I'll focus on that into the future of where this is going. So this is the title page, and I'd like to thank everybody on this for contributing to making this happen. Um, so I will start over here in the way that I feel one should walk into the space. I created this drawing as the way that humans read a book and as you would walk into a cave, how the drawings or the graffiti on the wall of a cave would tell you what goes on in that territory. So cave drawing has been a very important part of my work for a long time. Unlike street graffiti, I think about cave graffiti. Um, the early times where the caveman explored a different territory, they would make drawings on the wall that take you into the cave and take you out. The way that they would illuminate everything with a flame created this moment of movement. So I'm thinking a lot about movement as I work. The gesture is something that's very important to my work. It's a starting point to create a figurative work. 
and it's a way to create the proportional scale of the body. As a professor of life drawing, I've always taught students how to build a figure. In my work, I'm taking the figure apart and making it into something else. But the gesture is something that has always been a part of the beginning state of the figures, and that's where I like to keep it. Some of them take on forms and identity, such as the silhouettes or the shadows. I like to call them shadows because they're spirits. They loom over my characters in a good way. They're the ones that hold the most power in terms of color, dominance, and statue. The first thing that you think about, at least for me, when I look at this while drawing is the black and white. The black and white and the gray tones for me mimic how you would see if it was in color. So that's another thing I'll get to in a second. A lot of my past work, which I'll talk about real quick, was full color. But then three years ago, I thought I would get rid of color to create a, a different chapter in the work so that I have all the color and then all the black and white, and then when it's time to change to the next chapter, who knows what that will be. It could be sculpture. We don't know. But when we get there, it'll be a combination of a lot of things that make sense. And in that sense, I would like to talk about how drawing is made of all the elements, line, form, composition, rhythm, rhyme, balance, foreground, background, middle ground, layers of line. Line to me is very important because it talk, talks about movement and expression, balance, rhythm, and rhyme. And when I talk about those things, those are the things that really give the work its personality or gives the work its way of guiding the viewer into the composition. In this composition, it's very linear. This is a landscape that stretches around the whole room. So for me, I wanted my figures to go from cluttered space to empty in into a minimal state and then to a state where there's a quietness. So the wildness starts in the beginning. A lot of these guys have been in past works. Um, which I think most artists who make narrative work or pictures that require a set of characters that you would have in a book. So for me, I'm thinking a lot about how writers build compositions, short stories, fiction, poems. You have a structure and then you carry it away and then you develop it over time. For me, I'm thinking about how these figures are having a fantastic time. The jugglers are juggling while this group of people embrace. So those are two things that I'm thinking about. Um, fantastic fantasy, closeness, carefulness, careness, and gatheringness. So the thorns that you see, I'm gonna now talk about the content. <laughs> so the thorns that you see are not about pain. The thorns are about protection. My cactus figures here, I call them cactus suits. These are suits that are protecting the human flesh. Sort of like how porcupines and roses and um, animals that need protection. They have an armor suit. So for me, my characters have these suits in the way of protecting themselves. I thought about this based on my experience in the desert, admiring cactus and seeing how cactus, they have this protecting suit to protect themselves against things that want to eat them. And I think about porcupines. I'm thinking about um, roses, how they're so fragile and beautiful, but they have thorns to protect them from animals and humans who are wanting to take them away. So the thorns that you see 
become more of a protecting coat. Also, it becomes a really beautiful graphic movement that leads the eye through the composition. It helps the balance, it helps the rhythm of the flow of the different values and movement throughout the composition. So for me, I needed something to represent a form of clothing that would help them feel protected and also give a sense of movement. A lot of my influences come from looking at historical painters. Um, I feel like they have good information that will give you something to kind of start from but then find your own voice in. And that's what I think about a lot when I'm looking at Caravaggio, Francis Bacon, Dubuffet, Jacob Lawrence, William Kentridge, just to name a few. So with that in mind, I'm thinking about how my characters are developing and how my characters evolve throughout these landscapes. The gesture is here, the nude creatures are there, the shadows kind of hold the balance of everything. At the beginning of um, thinking about making this show, I wanted elements that would kind of give a little surprise and um, moments of discovery. So I fell in love with this idea of making veils for my characters. Um, this is a yogi. She's been in a few other drawings, wall drawings in the past. But I wanted this to be a, a joyful kind of moment because these are party tassels. So they do kind of <laughs> give you that sense of partiness. But now it's a, it's a veil that is protecting her from being seen. It's not a mask. There are no masks anywhere in this drawing. And that was something I was thinking about in March. It's like everybody's wearing a mask. I can't think of my characters being covered up because that's the form of expression, the mouth, the nose, the eyes. So I'm unveiling all of these guys because they are in a gathering of celebration and closeness and being together. There is a lot of touching, there's a lot of closeness, the artists working, the hand walkers walking, the people carrying this person in a very comfortable, careful way, the jugglers juggling together, the cactus hanging out with the couple. So these are moments that I want people to enjoy when they walk into this installation. People practicing yoga, headstands. Um, so with that in mind, I'm mixing a lot of things that I love, which is yoga, gatherings with friends and family, and humans contorting and flexing their bodies and expressing themselves through the way that they're posing. Um, a lot of the things that are combined carry that weight, um, such as the stretcher here. He's in a yoga pose. Um, the basket holder is also in a yoga pose. So these are things that make up the work. Um, this way of expressing the body, flexing, feeling, movement. The gesture gives me that movement, as you see here. Um, as the people pulling the thorns through, that's a sense of movement. So these are things that I'm thinking about as I'm creating composition that has a depth, a space, combination of elements. Um, so this is the wildness. As you're walking through the wildness, you walk into the silence. The silence is the space where you can just hang out and feel the way that these figures are feeling. I wanted a sense of falling which is a very intense feeling, but it's quiet, it's a beautiful space. You feel no weight. 
the hand spander, his hands are like roots holding onto the ground, finding its strength. That's what that's about. So through this moment of silence, um, I have the tassel just hanging as a way of showing light, movement, and reflection. And then you wander through that to the swimmers. The swimmers was something that I have always wanted to do. Um, I can think of one artist, Tori Tinsley, who made a painting that I saw a couple of um, years ago where she painted this scene of swimmers underwater and that really affected me and I thought oh my god I have to do that at some point I need to have a drawing where I'm trying to put people underwater and see how they perform so this is my gathering of swimmers swimming together and the juxtaposition of the glass and the drywall here was really perfect when I walked into the space. It really did make me feel really excited about making this juxtaposition because of the reflection of the falling figure, which it looks like it's in water, and then it's above the water. So it's kind of like this nice duality that I was really responding to when I came into the space. And then the swimmers are just gathering on top of the rocks, which is sitting on heads and hanging out. For me, that's a moment of where people are just hanging out, waiting for more swimming or just gathering to be together. So connectedness is something that's also important about this work, which we're slowly removing ourselves from because of the time. Here, the gatherers are gathering around a piece of work, which I call the art gatherers. For me, this moment is very special because it's showing how we need to gather again at some point and admire art. I love this moment because there's a lot of touching, there's a lot of closeness, but also there's this moment of surprise, which is the artwork. Through that, the large figure is stepping across the way, which is stretching, stretching, stretching. Um, he's like the connector of all in this composition. So for me, this guy is the leader, he's the ruler of this fantastic um, spiritual space. He's wearing the veil, and he's the biggest one in the room. So with that, I'm mixing a lot of things together. I have several pieces framed, which are windows inside of this larger picture, which I wanted people to have moments with them so that it would be another extension of the frame for me. The larger work here is the largest gathering in the whole pool. Um, I was thinking about how Renaissance painters have large-scale paintings with figures just piled on top of each other, and you don't know why but when you look at the title, it tells you everything. So for me, I was thinking about my gathering of people and how they're just at a swimming hole, just hanging out with nothing to do, but just hang out together. So this is the end of the whole wildness that's happening in this picture. From that, there's a lot of nice surprises with the, the shadow figures merging into the larger drawing. For me, that was a moment of awe and awesomeness. Like, that just happened on a whim, and I just rolled with it. And that, to me, shows that when you're responding to your work in a space, you just let those problems happen, and then they're either excited, exciting or they're not. But the idea of letting go to figure that out is something that I'm always willing to do. And I think that it's successful. And I think that it has opened up more adventures for me and future works. So the works on paper all happened between two residencies, um, Tempest Projects in Florida, Tampa, Florida, and the Hamage Arts Center in Science 
um, in North Georgia. There I made a series of works on paper that were um, kind of small glimpses of the larger wall drawings. But I wanted to have a connection with everything but a separation. And this is the silence also of taking a break from the wildness of the larger installation. Um, so they're all connected based on the shadow form and the cactus suits. This is called Mr. Grumpy. He's just grumpy. And these are drawings that were made late at night. So they have this moment of darkness. This is Tyson. Tyson happened a couple weeks after I received the award for this exhibition. And I feel like that was kind of the anchor for a lot of things that opened up after um, planning this whole show. With that, um, I wanted to bring in things that were part of the show on the back side, which are my tools, my vests, the materials that I use, which are ink and water. And music is very important to my practice and my art making. Here are some books that are very important to me. These are my heroes. These are people that speak the language that I choose to bring into my work. So drawing is something that's very important to me and has been important to me since I was a little kid. Painting and printmaking were also two mediums that my work has gone through over the years. Now it's stretching into wall drawings that are like installations or environments for people to walk into. Um, I think now we wanted, we saw that a lot of you took some liberties and said some fun things in our chat section and we wanted to open it up to questions right now for William. Um, and so if you have a question or kind of wanna engage in this discussion, we encourage you to type that question in the chat and um, William, if you can, Lead that discussion, that would be wonderful. Absolutely. Um, so we have a question from Heather uh, who asks, what were the book titles in your um, glass case? Um, so the first one was um, Jacob Lawrence, um, Just Above My Head and Fire Next Time. Um, a book of drawings by Louise Bourgeois. Um, um, in the work shed by Jack Witten and drawings of Francisco Clemente and I think that's it. Those are very inspiring books and I highly recommend them. The Louise Bourgeois book is out of print so you can go on eBay and find them but it's a rare one and it's really beautiful. Um, I can't really remember the title right now, but I can get that to you. Okay. Um, next question we have from Jared Christian, who asks, have you ever found or taken the opportunity to actually paint in a cave? Um, that's a great question. Um, when I was in graduate school, that was one project that I, I took on was to create a cave in my studio. Um, most of the caves I've seen have not been in America, but I have not visited them, so I have not drawn in a cave. But I wanted to recreate it by um, using place slip and drawing with um, actual charcoal that was made from burning a stick down to a charcoal. Um, so that was a time that I kind of reenacted a cave, um, but I wish that I could. That's something that I'm really dreaming about. And I know that there are some caves in America um, that I'm slowly getting out to see, but um, that's something that I really think about. Okay. Um, next, we have a question from Paula Evans, who said, first of all, she complimented and said, amazing show. Um, 
And she said, I was wondering if the archaeological quality of the tools slash artifacts on display reference this historical moment. Um, they do, and they kind of frame the, the, the influences such as um, the cal calligraphy writers and drawers from Japan. Um, that's how they made a lot of the paintings in woodblock prints. So the past is kind of what I'm seeking for, for the future or present, in which all of those things are what's used in the current work um, and works on paper. So yes, is the answer for that question. Okay, our next question is from Jessica Helfreich. Yes. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Um, please forgive me. She said, I was surprised to hear you've only been working in black and white for three years. That seems like a huge transition. Can you talk more about that? I can. Um, so black and white is something that I've always worked in, but only to like make the primary sketch for the work that's going to be in color. Or when I was, um, assigned to teach a color theory class when I was a professor, that was something that was always kind of a jarring thing. It's like, okay, I got to teach 2D. And with that, you always have to teach the value scale and then the color theory of color and put those two together. So I wanted to create a monumental chapter for me and that was to remove color because I had expressed that for so long. And that was something that I valued in. I love color and I love the responsibility of color, but I thought that, um, so what happened was is I had a conversation with my father. He was in the hospital and he's been one of my heroes and someone who I've talked to for all my life, probably twice a day sometimes before he passed away. But we were talking and I was like, I ran into a wall and I think I need to think of something that's going to help the next um, groups of works. And he was like, well, why don't you just make them black and white? And I was like, whoa, that's awesome. I'm going to do that. And when I got back to Atlanta, I started working on just ink wash drawings and that started to cycle into this moment of, okay, this is going to be the epic moment where I start making color and just focus on black and white. And that's what's been happening. And it went from just on paper to the wall. And now it's going to murals and it's getting bigger. And the one at Mocha is probably the long or the biggest one so far in black and white. But um, I'm really excited about it. And it helps me work so fast and quick because of the way that um, I draw. So it's a really good fluid um, medium. Okay. Um, our next question is from Scott Morris, who asked, what music did you listen to the most while working on the show? Good question. Um, so I, I fell in love with this album called On the Beach by Neil Young. And it was on a, a uh, art shipment of some work that I was taking to Florida um, a year ago and On the Beach is probably one of the saddest songs that Neil Young has ever written and through the song there's a um, interview with Neil Young talking about each song and I was so blown on my feet by the way that Neil works on music and how he a doesn't care if anybody likes it or not and he's such a anal retentive person about how the structure is started but it's always okay when things bend a little bit so i love the way that he was talking about the album and how he asked five friends to meet him at this one beach house that they all stayed in for two months while recording the album and it made me value my friends and how i love them and how i try my best to be the best friend to everybody and touch them, talk to them, and be clear and always be available because I love friendship and I love how that um, goes into my work and my life. So On the Beach has been the song that 
has lingered and loomed over my new philosophy. Um, so that was one album. And then the second album was um, the, there's this Prince album that's not on the book, or it's not um, in publish. I got it on eBay, it's a bootleg, but it's called, um, title just slipped my mind it's it's all instrumental so i love how prince can remove vocals sometimes and just focus on the music so that soundtrack was behind everything and then um there's this beautiful bunny prince billy album will oldham is his name um he re-sang some merle haggard songs and i i love that album because it's when you sing songs by other people and you make it yours, I feel like that's how artists should work when they make work that reflects their heroes. They have to make it theirs and find their voice. So those are three albums that I really loved and listened to through making. All right. I'm sorry, am I interrupting you? <laughs> no, 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 I'm sorry if I'm rambling along. You no, stop. you aren't. <laughs> Don't let me interrupt you. Be like, Ariel, be quiet. <laughs> um, <laughs> So we have a question from Marsha Cohen who says, William, the show looks marvelous. Congratulations. Um, you spoke about the cave at the beginning of your talk. My Plato's cave has, I guess, has Plato's cave ever been an influence with respect to shadows and illusion? Yes. When I was in graduate school, I um, had really deep conversations with John Yao, who was our um, visiting lecturer or visiting poet. He's the one that turned me on to that. So I did spend a lot of time thinking about that. And I'm glad that she brought that up because I wanted to re reference that, but I forgot the title, but yes. Um, and Marsha Cohen was one of my um, most important um, instructors at ACA who kind of saw that my brain was expanding and she just pushed me to expand it more and gave me the biggest challenge. One of the biggest challenges, there's a few other people, but um, she was definitely one of the instructors that really did get me to open up and think about um, like breaking the drawing, seeing as inside. Okay. Next, we have a question from Felipe Thomas, who said, outstanding work as always. How long did it take for you to go from concept to finished work for the wall drawings? Uh, that's a good question. Um, so the, the first um, meeting with Mocha, in my mind, I thought that the show was gonna be in the upstairs gallery, which this is a new um, space. So I made this idea of having the biggest drawing that I could ever make, which would reach 40 feet by, I think 30 feet is how long that wall was. And then it would just have nothing else but seats in that space, in this gigantic wall drawing. But then they told me, no, we're moving into the downstairs space. And I had never really thought about how that space would work for me until I did a site visit. And this is, I think, two weeks before I was supposed to come in to work. And walking into the space, I immediately started thinking about how I was going down into the ground or going downstairs. That, to me, um, opened up the cave um, art department in my brain. So that's when I started thinking about everything was when I went down for the second site visit. So it took that to kind of open up these ideas of creating um, a backdrop of humans in a landscape that was kind of like a cave. Okay, we have a question from Paula Evans who says, are you aware that certain Native American shamans wear fringes over their eyes when in transcendental states? Very like, but less shiny than your figure wears. Yes, and, and I had to do a lot of research before making them so that I could feel um, 
responsibility of altering it and making it mine. Um, so I am aware of that. And so from that, um, there are other artists such as Nikki, who also thinks about Native Americans and uses his body suits as a reflection of that. Um, so I was looking at who he was looking at also. But yes, I was aware of that and I wanted mine to stand out a little bit, but also I wanted to kind of embrace um, a, a, a difference of it, like keep my line involved, which is the shiny line. That's why I love um, the party tinsels. But that's a great question. Okay, I think I have a comment from I2 Ribeiro who says, love viewing those huge moments on the walls through the vitrines. By the way, the books were James Baldwin's Going to Meet the Man, Louis Bourgeois's Drawings and Observations, Jack Whitten's Notes from the Woodshed, B.F. Schneider's Renoir, Dear Nemesis, Nicole Eisman's 1993 to 2013, and a weekend with Diego Rivera by Braun. Thanks, fact checker. Um, <laughs> and then he also asks, he also says the show is fire, fire, fire. Would love to hear about the characters in these works that doubled as parts of the landscapes. Um. So the characters who I carry a lot are the, the gesture, the one that is just a gesture. He's kind of like the symbol of freedom, symbol of expression. He's kind of like the way that I start because it's the workout to kind of loosen yourself up before you start making everything else. So there's always one of those in every drawing. And that's the way I just start it and just kind of get loose and get wild, shake it up. And um, after making that, everything else happens. So the, there's always a downward dog um, cactus suit guy. And I think um, there's some humor in that one. And then there's always, um, a female figure and then there's um, a duality figure with two heads and there's always people looking forwards backwards and in the presence so they have three points of view so those are four characters i can talk about without taking up the whole hour of tonight um it looks like the rest, I don't know. I, it looks like we don't have any more questions. We have comments. Marsha Cohen said, um, one second, I lost it. One second. She said, thank you, William. Wishing you the best. Um, Majora Frey said, thank you for sharing, William. Looks great. And we'll see you in person soon. Um, let's see. Maria Artemis. Let's, sorry, my um, chat section is getting away from me. Uh, Maria mm -hmm. Artemis said, amazing work, William. Congratulations. Love seeing your work evolving and hearing you speak about it. Um, Atu said, love the moments of bridging. And then we do have, let's see. Okay, a couple more questions. And we've got 15 more minutes. So I think we might, Salinas Mountain, that's, we're going to have you have the last question. Um, Jack Kunt said, I came a bit late to the talk, so you may have touched on this in the beginning, but I follow you on social media and see the in process time lapses. When I see your work, I don't just see the final product. I think of your process too. You have talked about some of your making rituals, but do you have any restraints on yourself for the process? Mm. Restraints. Um... I don't think I have restraints, but I do have order in terms of the madness. <laughs> um, I think from my life as an art handler for a long time, um, I kind of think about the process of what it takes to travel and lay out the tools and then how as an artist to build a frame when I'm making gigantic wall drawings. It's like you have to 
see the picture in a big way if you don't use projectors. I don't use projectors, which um, I'm starting to lean on that maybe for the future, but right now it's just straightforward um, um, making the scale based on the knowledge of, of how to stretch the body. So um, my rituals sometimes um, I have to have coffee, bourbon, water, and <laughs> beer, and... Um, what time does the bourbon come out? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> In celebration, you know, you don't know. <laughs> If we're feeling good in the space and everything is looking good, then we celebrate a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> but um, those are the things, the key items. And then if I'm flying somewhere, I have to figure out that because that's a different ritual in terms of getting my head right, being in a new space, a new territory. So I might do a walk just to see how the environment is. And then I bring a little bit of that into the space. So one thing that I do do is I bring in nature that is from the area, um, such as yeah. in St. Louis, I used um, a tree that was out front of the museum. I used that as a stencil. Um, and the same thing with mocha, there's a tree in the backyard that I just cut. I apologize to the plants first, and then I clip it, and then I bring it to the gallery and I use spray paint to use it as a stencil to create evidence of the nature that's around um, the territory in which I'm working in. So those are things, those are kind of my rituals that I kind of maintain when I do these projects in different spaces. Like I was just in Miami on Monday and the tree that was in front of the condo that I worked in, I used that as um, a stencil for that piece. So. Those are things that I hold on tight to. Paula Ritz has asked, do you pre-plan when you draw? Um, I try my best to um, have a plan at first um, mentally. Um, there's only a few times where I had to have a plan. And I think when I'm working with public planners, which I'm doing right now, I have a mural coming up in November in Decatur and that one is all planned out they want we've gone through three different phases and three different structures of that wall drawing so that the mural will be um, passed through different people so they can say yes no we don't like that can you change this so this is the first time in a long time that I'm having a drawing that's being critiqued by people who um are learning about my work and people who want something that can be in their environment that they walk by every day that they can admire. So I'm tailoring my thing, my work to that. And it's a process and it makes me a little lazy because it's like, ah, oh, I like to be spontaneous. Ah, oh, I like to just come in and do my thing. But sometimes you have to hold back and work with people and give them, you know, examples before you execute so that was a good question that's what I'm doing right now pre-planning and then our last question is from Salinas Mountain yep. and she says can you talk about how your physicality informs your drawing practice both in a studio sense but also in terms of figures and bodies in your work p.s love the show Nice. Um, so to, to go back to um, when I started making figurative work, I always thought about how body language tells a lot about a person. And from that, I learned about how Merce Cunningham in New York would stand on the street and observe people and watch their body language and then go into their dance studio, studio and recreate different gestures that people would do that he saw that made his movements um, interesting. So I started doing that too, like watching people a little bit closer and mimicking their gestures in my work. And in yoga, I've fallen in love with the hardest poses to use as my characters, such as 
headstands, handstands, um, the crow, and there are a few other ones. But I love how that um, body language can translate through my language, which I stretch it and bend it and create these um, weird people. And for me as an ex-runner, or I, I run now, but running track taught me how um, to develop a body and how you have to have structure, discipline, and routine to create um, a super body and how running is such an intense thing that you can't just go out and run, you have to train. You have to do all these things to make your body do that. So I think about that in my drawings. It's like all these characters I'm piling up. They're from, um, since we can't be in a gym right now, I had to look online and watch people do yoga. So some of these characters come from the people that I was admiring on how they can stretch their bodies. So that's um, something I think about. And that's what the work is about expanding the body and bending it and twisting it and turning it into something else. Michael Jordan is another person that I've been looking at um, for the last three years as a hero character. Um, I fell in love with the way that his body is so unique and his hands are so large and the way that he's so graceful and he stretches across the basketball floor that's kind of the beginning of me stretching my figures across the walls. Um, so he was kind of the inspiration in the beginning of like making these guys stretch across and how their big hands hold piles of people. Um, so Michael is someone that I really study and think about. Um, I think uh, I'd like to thank everybody that came tonight and um, Stacy's mom, who's in Washington, everybody in New York, um, Atlanta, all my friends. I miss all of you guys, I miss your faces. And Paula, she's always been an amazing um, person. I met her at Amazon Ranch. She's an amazing artist, amazing human. Um, I love her support. And all the wolves out there, I send my love to you and my cousin. So, um, Yes, I'll end there before I get a little teary up. But um, <laughs> thank you for um, introducing me and thanks to Annette and Stacy for all of you guys' hard work. It's been a treasure and a pleasure to be a part of this. And it's, um, um, it's amazing. So thank you. <laughs>